Hey, everybody out there for joining us today. We're going to do our third edition of our monthly compost gardening farming chat where we take any questions folks have sent to us throughout the month or any we receive uh, today during the chat. So the first thing we're going to cover is getting into backyard composting. If you've ever thought about it, this is the best time of year to get into backyard composting. Typically, the issue in backyards is we don't have enough carbon. We don't have enough brown stuff. Well, it's leaf season. They're falling and literally materials are falling out of the sky. So this is the time of year to jump into backyard composting and go ahead and get into it. So the first thing we need to do is we need to get a bin or a pile. We need to find a location in our yard and figure out how we're going to do it. Now, some counties here in Maryland, like uh, Anne Arundel County, Howard County, there are free bins available to county residents. If you check out your local recycling office webpage, um, or you can find online, just put in Google into Google compost bins or backyard bin on Google image is going to show you a hundred different ways to do it. So the second thing we want to do is gather our raw materials. So like I said, leaves are falling. Let's rake them up. And then we can also need something that has nitrogen in it. So we call those greens, if you will. Um, one option people might not know about is if you go to Starbucks, any Starbucks in the world, they'll give you free coffee grounds to use in your garden or in your compost pile. Coffee grounds are great, nice fine particles. After they've been brewed, they're not nearly as acidic and they provide a nice nitrogen source that critters are not gonna necessarily be interested in. So if you mix leaves and coffee grounds together, you're gonna do great. One other option this time of year, pumpkins. One thing to note on pumpkins is you may wanna take the seeds out of your pumpkin before you compost it. Although sometimes the best pumpkins I end up in the garden or in the compost bin, the volunteers. So just be advised that seeds may be an issue, but if you smash up your pumpkin, put it in with your leaves, that also does well. The last thing we want to think about after we mix them together um, is the actual composting process. One thing is when we mix them together, two to one, two parts leaves or three parts leaves to the coffee grounds or the greens. So two to one, three to one, browns to greens, leaves to coffee grounds, food scraps, things like that. But then the last thing is keeping an eye on it. So maybe if we have time in a couple of weeks, we can turn the pile. Um, and then moisture is typically the busiest, the biggest issue. So if you were to reach in a compost pile and squeeze the material with your hand like this and then open it, if it doesn't clump, it's too dry. We need to add moisture to the pile. If you squeeze it and water just pours out and it's a mucky mess, it's too wet. And we need to add leaves or some other dry material to help stop it up. And if you were to squeeze it and just a drip or two comes out of your fingers, that's 50 to 60% moisture. You're right on the right spot where you want to be. So typically in backyard piles, Moisture is kind of the factor that people forget about. So if you do that simple squeeze test, and if you squeeze it and just a drip or two comes out, that means you're right where you need to be for composting. So find a bin and a location, find some raw materials, mix them together, two to three parts to one, browns to green, and then keep an eye on moisture, and off you go. Uh, in a couple months, you'll have great compost. So that's something we can do outside, but we know it's getting colder as we sit out here in the shade with our jackets and our flannel on. So one thing we want to talk about this month is indoor growing and things to think about where we can take the party inside and keep growing throughout the winter. So I'll let Julie kind of answer some of the questions that people had about that. Yeah, so it's fall. It's getting cold. Um, first frosts are happening and it's time to start thinking about, you know, do you need to bring some plants indoors? And then if you want to keep on growing herbs or leafy greens throughout the winter, how do you do that? Um, so most, most perennial herbs will overwinter just fine in the ground in this region. Uh, however, if you've got herbs in pots, um, the pots that are above the ground are exposed to more harsh cold temperatures. So you might want to keep that in mind and bring some of those in. You can either just bring them in, make sure they're you know not too dry, not too wet, and let them go dormant in a garage or in a basement. Um, or if you want to keep harvesting herbs throughout the winter, you can use some supplemental lighting um, to keep them going. So that's a good you know, transition to getting to, you know, how do I grow? Um, if you want to grow leafy greens or if you want to grow uh, baby herbs, like baby basil is actually a really great way to get a lot of basil growing in the winter time. Um, so yeah, lighting is probably one of the first things you're going to start thinking about and start looking for. Uh, if you look online or if you go to a hardware store, and you look at like professional grow lights, those are often very expensive. So you have to think about, is it is it really worth the investment? Yes, they are designed for optimal growth, but oftentimes 
um, there's kind of like in between options, or I, I usually just opt for a typical shop light. Um, so that's the one with the long tube fluorescent yeah, bulbs. Long tube fluorescent bulbs. Okay. You can get LED shop lights as well, but in my experience, the LEDs, even though they're kind of a similar price and they last forever, um, they don't put off as much heat and they don't put off quite as much light as the uh, as the fluorescent LED bulbs. So I like to use the four foot long ones because I think you get the most um, light for your money that way. Uh, you can also use shorter ones or if you have, you know, if you have a grow rack, the second thing you want to start thinking about is where are you going to hang the lights? Like what's the structure going to be? Um, this here is a nice grow rack from uh, Tractor Supply that we've had sitting around for a while. It fits a 10 by 20 tray. Nicely, these are standard trays that you can buy at any gardening center. This one happens to have drainage in it, which is really helpful, especially if you're growing, you know, microgreens or baby greens, sometimes outdoors when you don't control the, um, when you don't control the moisture. But when you're growing indoors, you can choose whether you want to just very carefully water without drainage. Um, you have to be careful not to overwater, or you can have drainage and um, not worry as much about overwatering. But then you do need to start thinking about things like, uh, like where is the water gonna go? Where is it sitting in my house? It's ideal to do this in a basement with a you know concrete floor or tile floor or something like that. But there are ways to put tarps down and like you know contain contain water from watering. I like to use capillary action mats. Um, it's basically felt. That's really all it is. But um, it just absorbs a ton of water. So when you water your plants, a little bit runs onto the mat, and especially if you have it inside of a tray with a little bit of a lip. That really keeps the water nicely contained within your house. So if I take a couple of trays from a fast food restaurant and uh, lay the mat down, yeah. have something that maybe contains the water a little bit? Yeah, put a little tray under here. Okay. Or um, the, the type of shelf that I have, it actually has a little bit of a lift. It's a four foot long one. And I installed it upside down and put a sheet of plastic underneath and then layered the capillary action mat. So there's like a half inch where I can, if I'm going to be away for a weekend, I just water the heck out of the mat to keep things nice and moist in there. And then it wicks up from underneath. And then it wicks up from underneath. And that's especially good for um, starting seedlings. Uh, but we'll talk more in detail about starting seedlings at another time. Okay. When the, when the time comes. For something like this, you would put smaller pots in this or you would just put soil throughout this and then plant your seeds in this for like something like this? Okay. Yeah, so you can do either. Um, one way to contain, like if this was one that didn't have holes and you want to contain your water, you can put smaller pots in here and then water and then the water will stay stay in here and not get all over your house. Um, if you want to grow microgreens or baby greens, I will often use trays like this and fill up, you know, two inches of soil, lightly sprinkle the seeds on top, cover, and then water and they grow. The nice thing about using these trays with shop lights is you can fit two of them conveniently under the shop lights. and. They grow really well. Another thing to keep in mind with lighting is it's ideal to have adjustable height because the closer the lights are to the plants, the more lighting they're going to get. And that really does help a lot with growth. And then you just adjust that as things start to grow then? Yeah, yeah. You want to keep them at like a you know half inch to an inch even away from, from the plant. From the plant itself. Mm -hmm. And then is it more, what about like that provides the light and you talked about heat. I mean, is there, we just kind of look at the seed packet, same temperature, keep that in mind. I know like our house, may not be as warm as the garden was in the summer or like how yeah. much do you worry about temperature yeah so that's another great question if you're growing inside of your house most plants you know if it's a comfortable temperature for you most plants will be fine um you could also look into getting a ceiling heat mat one thing that's nice about this structure is it it does have a it can be enclosed so that keeps the heat in the lights put off heat it'll get a little bit warmer and more humid inside there but uh i also like to use ceiling heat mats especially for things like um well, again, for seedlings, tomatoes that like to germinate in warmer, warmer temperatures, but it's basically just a thin mat that you put, um, again, dimensions, those usually come in, they can come in smaller dimensions or two by fours if you're going to do a, you know, a two by four shelf. And you just slip that underneath everything. Most of them are waterproof, so it's okay if you get them a little bit wet. And then the heat just rises and heats the, the soil and the root zone, and then it'll keep, you know, the space right above the plant. That's cool. Too. Yeah, I bought soil heating cables years ago for my worm bins to keep my worms like warm in the winter. So there are like yeah, kind of cool options out there to just plug into an outlet for keeping 
stuff warm. So yeah, yeah. And then another thing to keep in mind is um, timer. If you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna be away and you don't want to remember to unplug and plug in every every morning, it's really easy to uh, just set up one of those little automatic timers. Make sure you have that plugged into a, a power strip and all of your lights plugged into the timer. But if you're using a heat mat or you know if you're growing in a basement and you want to use a space heater or something to keep things warm, make sure that the space heater is not plugged into that same timer because you want the heat on consistently. Consistently and certainly in, in the nighttime when it gets colder, that's when you have the lights off. So you definitely want to keep the heat on a different. And what do you think? Outlet. I mean, what are the kind of things to watch out for that the mistakes people make? I guess probably same thing with most plants. Overwatering is probably mm -hmm. a thing to watch out for, mm -hmm. and then I guess light and heat. Yeah, overwatering, light and heat. Um, you know, don't don't try and plant too many things in too small of a space. Uh, like light, I think light is really the biggest thing. And you know, keep your expectations realistic. You're not gonna get tomatoes <laughs> in over, right. Bell over pepper's not gonna happen. With a fluorescent light, unless sure. you're to invest in some serious like commercial quality. Sure. Grow, green grow house lights, but um, yeah, plant spacing. Um, you know, I, people like microgreens. I, I like microgreens, but I think you get more, you know, I think you get more plants for your, I don't know, for your seed investment if you grow them to baby green size. Okay. So you can, you can even get multiple cuttings that way if you just, you know, give, give the whole thing a little haircut and let it grow back a week or two later. But so yeah. like, a, like, a, like a small greens mix or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And another thing to look out for is, um, just trying not to make a mess and you'll, you'll develop your own ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it is really amazing how, you know, how much soil can get all over somebody's house. I was, I was, you know, in, a, in an apartment in quarantine, um, not in quarantine, sorry, during uh, the lockdown. We all got to enjoy a quarantine. Yes, yes. Yeah. But I really, I turned this whole sunroom into a, a grow light station and um, it was pretty well contained, but you know, a little, a little we all of. have spouses and roommate situations to manage <laughs> just like any other battles you want to pick right so yeah cool yeah okay well great well hey appreciate everybody tuning in and uh being part of the episode if you have any other questions in the future you can email us info at veterancompost.com or send us a facebook message anytime and we'll do our best to either help you out or uh bring it up next month i think next month what we're going to do getting into december is look at seed catalogs maybe talk a little bit about soil testing and kind of some of those things we can do to kind of get excited for spring and, and look to the future, probably good in life in general and uh, especially in the garden. So thanks to everybody for tuning in and we'll catch you next month.